everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Nostalgia Trap. My name is David Parsons, and I am sick and tired of hearing about war. It's almost unbelievable to watch the Obama administration march towards Iraq as if the last 10 years of horror didn't already happen. Um, War is something that's been a constant feature of uh, world events since I can remember. I was raised during the Reagan 1980s with uh, um, you know, the threat of atomic war happening um, and playing with G.I. Joe dolls. I guess they were action figures by that time. Um, but, you know, watching the, the first Gulf War unfold, watching, uh, you know, 9-11 and the war on terror and George W. Bush and the Patriot Act and now the Obama administration's drone wars and continued hell in the Middle East um, is something that uh, um, has, has, you know, to, to, to put it lightly, has troubled me. Um, and I guess, you know, perhaps that's a little bit of that is because I, um, you know, ended up studying the Vietnam War as a, as a graduate student. And the Vietnam War became kind of the primary lens through which I understand the American military machine and what it does around the world. Um, my, my guest today is someone who's helped me in that investigation. He was my advisor um, on my dissertation and someone who uh, guided me in, a, in, in, in graduate school towards a, a particular view of American history, a particular, um, uh, um, a, a particular take on, on, on American history. His name is Josh Brown. He's a professor of history at the CUNY Graduate Center. Um, his book uh, is called Beyond the Lines, uh, Pictorial Reporting, Everyday Life and the Crisis of Gilded Age America. Um, and I first encountered Josh um, through through taking classes um, at the Graduate Center in American History, obviously. But the, the class that, that, that really blew my mind was a class uh, uh, that he taught on visual culture that um, was uh, about primarily the 19th century. But the history we looked at, uh, literally looked at, was uh, about kind of figuring out how uh, visual iconography fits into um, the way we remember history, the way Americans kind of visualize history literally and visualize the things that are happening around them. Um, and that, that thought and that idea really began my investigation into the 1960s and the visual culture of the 1960s. Um, and so I worked with Josh on, on some papers. I ended up working at the New Media Lab, an American social history project of which he's uh, uh, the director. Um, and, and w- you know, we had, uh, we had a kind of um, a lot of great conversations about his experiences during the 1960s, and he helped me kind of figure out uh, and, and correct a lot of my assumptions and a lot of my ideas about what went on during that era. He's someone who was active in the, uh, the anti-war movement during that era, um, and he has a lot of amazing stories to tell about that experience, including being at the Democratic National Convention um, in Chicago in 1968, which uh, any of you who know your 1960s history know um, that that was, uh, you know, an, an iconic moment and turning point in the in the whole era. Um, so I hope you enjoy this conversation with Josh Brown. You can find um, more of his stuff online if you go to joshbrownnyc.com. He's got an awesome set of comics called Life During Wartime. Um, he's a cartoonist and someone who uh, it, it has a, a really particular and and I think profound take on uh, on the events that uh, of, of 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 war, um, particularly during uh, the the era of the the quote unquote war on terror and beyond. Uh, so check out his comics, and while you're online, you can find more Nostalgia Trap podcast episodes uh, at nostalgiatrap.libsyn.com. Um, you can also find me on the Stitcher Radio Network, where you can download a, 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 a an app that you can put on your phone and, and, and listen to wherever. Um, and you can also uh, go to the Facebook page, Nostalgia Trap, uh, and, and like it on there, and you'll get updates on new episodes and stuff like that. Um, so I hope you enjoy this episode and this conversation between me and Josh Brown. So just uh, so I'm you know, in the middle of the baby boom generation, or maybe it's the the second wave. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I probably became. A, I mean, I certainly knew they had served in World War II. Um, you know, it, sort of like every male, I would say uh, that uh, was uh, in the orbit of my you know parents' friends 
had served in one way or other in military mm. during World War II. Um, that may be also the nature of their age at that time. In particular, all of them would have been in their early 20s or, or late teens yeah. at, the, at that time. Uh, I think I really became... I, I remember, you know, as you're a kid and you're, you're rustling through your parents' drawers or you're mm -hmm. going through various places you're not supposed to go. And I remember coming across a scrapbook, mm. uh, you know, with very loosely uh, glued down or simply, you know, just shoved in place uh, sketches. Mm. Um, and in some cases, actually also um, uh, small sketch pads. That, right. You know, he would have like drawers full of small sketch pads. And, right. And looking through it and seeing that, you know, there were military, you know, pictures of uh, drawings rather and uh, and some watercolors and things like that of uh, clearly soldiers. The other thing now that you remind me was there was this mysterious painting that was in my grandparents. These are my maternal grandparents. Right. Uh, apartment. We lived uh, in when I was uh, young in Stuyvesant Town you know, in lower Manhattan, and they lived in Peter Cooper Village, was the slightly higher middle income. Uh, Were you raised in Stuyvesant Town? Was that your primary childhood home when you think from, about childhood? Yeah, two and a half to about 13. Okay, yeah. 12 or 13. Uh, horrible place. Oh. And, the, <laughs> and, the, and in the middle of nowhere in Manhattan, it's sort of amazing. But what I remember is that in their apartment, my uh, grandparents, who I, I lived with at different periods of time, right. uh, they had this painting, this sort of uh, naturalistic painting of what looked like an El Greco of some sort of town. Mm. And when I inquired at one point, so that's an Italian town, I can't remember what the name was, it your father's first painting. Right. Uh, which he painted after the war, but so there was okay. always this sort of looming. And the drawings painting. themselves were like were pencil drawings or they're they, ink. They range from uh, you know pencil drawings to pen and ink to in some cases sort of watercolor to more finished things if he had time. And these were these were, I mean he was he served in uh, North Africa and Italy, and he also did you know basic training in Louisiana. Okay, and he always drew. I mean this is you know he had. Gone did you know your father as an artist? I mean, before you found this, oh, this yeah. sketchbook, so you knew that, was he a working artist? Yeah, I mean, when I was very, very young, he was doing comic books, okay. and yeah. uh, he was always painting, and uh -huh. he painted throughout his whole life, and he was a commercial artist, so okay. you know, he worked at home, too, yeah. so like, I, my mother went out to work, and my father worked at home. Okay, So, yeah, yeah I was very well aware that, you know, that he, w he was an artist. Uh, it was more that, you know, there were a few things I'd come across, same sort of things, he had notebooks, some notebooks when he was a kid, mm -hmm. that he had done sketches in and I you know I would just you know find these things and they were curiosities because a lot of them were things like redrawing you know cartoon characters from the 1930s mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. 1920s from newspapers and things like right. that. right so anyhow that's where I first became aware of the relationship to World War II having said that he barely ever talked about the war right uh, I would come up in for example one I remember in this case, at this point, I think it's after we left Stives in town, we moved up to the Upper West Side. That was our big moving on up when I got my own room, for example. And, <laughs> okay. And uh, and I when think, was that? How old were you, were you when that happened? I was 13, I think. It okay. It was eighth grade, 1962. I mm. remember what it was. It was just before the Cuban Missile Crisis, as a matter of fact. Okay. Uh, and uh, there was there were two TV series that came out around that time, both of which were about World War II. One was called Combat. I can't remember what the other was called. One was on on ABC, the other I think was on CBS, it's not important, mm -hmm. except that what, he watched it once or twice with me, and he said, oh, this is bullshit, this is just not the way. Not real. That's not real, yeah. you know, after a battle, you know, it's like after the battle, you know, they're all like, you know, back, patting each other on the back and stuff like yeah. that, and he would just say, you know, you're you're completely exhausted and it's horrible and blah. Mm. That was it. It sort of was, that's just, and he didn't watch it anymore. He yeah. watched it once, and, you know, that was sort of it. And I remember it was until I was a teenager that he would go to see, World, he wouldn't see World War II movies. He wouldn't do anything like that. So it wasn't like this would come up in right, conversations. Right, right. So, I mean, I think that's an experience of a lot of veterans yeah. is it's not something that you bring up during dinner. No. Um so you know what was your what was your father's attitude towards war? What, I mean, it, how did how did politics ha function in the house at all uh, regarding war? Well, um, my father was not very political, but mm -hmm. he was. Um, I think he he had a, a very cynical attitude toward uh, not about the Second World War. He he felt very proud actually for having on one level that having fought 
even though he had a very bad, very, very traumatic, very, very difficult combat experience. And I should say he had uh, like world-class psoriasis, uh, which was uh-huh. which really developed during the course of the war. And I mean, with psoriasis, so, I mean, I grew up with this notion that you had scales all over your body. That yeah, was just right. the way it was. I remember my wife has said to me that, you know, when she first met my father, I was like, whoa. You know, oh, wow. You okay. Know, she was really taken aback. Yeah. Um, but I raised that. So it was this weird, like, marker, but I never mm. thought of that as a World War II marker. I mean, he wasn't, you know, he hadn't been shot or anything like that, but he had but this. But there was physical and emotional yeah. trauma yeah. associated and he had that, with it. Yeah, had it throughout his life and, you know, suffered from a, from it. Uh, you know, throughout his life. But uh, having said that, what he had the cynical attitude more like you sacrifice, you you sacrifice and nobody will thank you for it. Mm. So it was more like when I got politically involved around the Vietnam War, it wasn't that he was opposed to my being involved in the war, uh, in the anti-war effort. Uh It was more like, you know, you're going to sacrifice for, for, you know, Americans who will not appreciate mm. you know your sacrifice. That's really interesting yourself. considering uh, like even even he would even see the anti-war movement as something that you would that that is a sacrifice for the country in yeah. the same way that going to war might be considered, right? right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um yeah, that's a really really kind of interesting idea. Uh, um so as you as you move forward in your life and you you uh, uh, get older um, you know, and I say, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis. You say you're like around 13 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, how how did you relate to to the Vietnam War starting to starting to emerge as a as a major as a as a major part of what's going on in the world? Uh, well, you know, for I think I, I, I everybody was you know it, this is it's a cliche now, but you know you saw this on TV every every day. Mm-hmm. So the the and the sort of escalation of the of the war, even in in its uh, you know pre uh, Johnson phase, yeah. obviously when it really takes off, it was it was clearly very much a consciousness. And as a young man, you were very well aware that you were going to hit that magic age of eighteen, uh-huh. and you were going to have to register for the draft. And there was a draft, mm. uh, and indeed, uh, you know, I uh, I. My family, it was more my mother, my mother and my mother's side of the family were very active in the Democratic Party. Mm. My, my grandfather had been in charge of the foreign language groups for the Democratic Party in New York City. He was okay. a judge. Uh, my mother was a lawyer and very active. Uh, they were Truman Democrats, right? mm-hmm. you know, FDR and Truman Democrats. Um, so uh, that aspect in terms of being involved with sort of democratic politics I was involved but they were in many ways very anti-communist when I was very young and I only rec- recollected as much later I realized that I would go with my grandparents every year to the loyalty day oh, wow. demonstrations yeah. which of course no longer exists but they were basically in many ways an anti uh, a response to labor day and the uh, and against may day mm. and it was uh, it was a day where Everybody declared their loyalty, and on Fifth Avenue had a parade, and I would sit in the stands with my grandparents. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I remember, actually, this is what my recollection, like sitting with Cardinal Spellman and uh, Oh, wow. And other so this was like during that. the Eisenhower administration? Yeah, it must have been during yeah. either, either. Certainly, uh, for me to remember it, it must have been right. Eisenhower. Yeah. yeah. And anyhow, so there's there's a there's a political awareness. Um, my my parents were critical of the war even early on, uh, largely because uh, they, at the same time as they, uh, as you know, they were I guess, I guess you say Truman Democrats. They just knew an awful lot of people have been blacklisted. Yeah. And my parents, also coming from an art background, knew an awful lot of folks who had, uh, and they always made that a point. You know, they would always mm. if something came about blacklisting, they would always you know bring that up. So it's an interesting sort. Yeah, of it's a push and pull flex. between being anti-communist. And, and revolted by the uh, um, uh, by go- the the instances of you know quote unquote going too far into the anti communism and certainly the yeah, McCarthyism and, and, right and in many ways well yeah the that's the famous thing about Eisenhower with McCarthy with uh, when McCarthyism when Mac- or when McCarthy um, was was censured in in the Senate um, Eisenhower made the joke to the press it's more like McCarthy isn't than McCarthyism and right. and and he was uh, you know I don't think Eisenhower was any fan of McCarthy no no well I, I you know I, of course McCarthyism uh, is we won't get lost in this but mm-hmm. there's also a stylistic issue in other words there's sort of like uh well you know it's okay to be anti-communist and it's okay to repress people but you don't want to be crude about yeah it, yeah know? and it's, it's 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 like the way mainstream republicans might relate to like a michelle bachman or a ted exactly. cruz or something right exactly. like you, know, it. you, you gotta have style you know? <laughs> if you're gonna repress you have to have style yeah uh classy you gotta be classy about it so anyhow the, the long and the short about all this is that i i became aware of it but i wasn't until 
Uh, I had a uh, a great uncle who had been who was a self professed socialist. You know, you American talk so he's anti communist, but he's a socialist. A great uncle, so someone. So this is this was a brother my, of a grandparent. This was my uh, my grandmother's brother, okay. my maternal grandmother's brother. My parents were both only children. A a, ra- a true radical in the family somewhere. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in in a in a, in a very uh, Norman Thomas was his god. For example. okay, yeah. And uh, he took. He asked my parents if I could go with him. He was a very troubled guy, uh, as many radicals are. I guess. Yes, I guess so. <laughs> Haunted certainly. Yeah. And he, uh, but he asked if, and I, I think I'm at the time. I'm. This is uh, probably 62, 60. No, no, it's been about sixty three. Anyhow, he maybe in a little later, but he, early anti war demonstration run by the Socialist Party in Washington DC. And I okay. went down to him with him. So it was about negotiation now. It was not about with withdrawing troops or anything like this. this is very early on. Very Before I, the Gulf of Tonkin. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Or or um it may have actually been after been but, around that but what I'm raising here is that the anti-war movement had uh, probably the first SDS that big SDS demonstration yeah, yeah. the only SDS demonstration uh-huh. in Washington had already taken place so maybe it's actually like 65 66 okay my my point at this point is it was extremely non-militant uh very uh um polite Mm. Very kind uh, of like still like um, in the in, in in kind of in the in the vein of the 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 nineteen fifties and early sixties civil rights movement, right? I, is, would you characterize it as that tone? Well, I think it's also the, this uh, a moment uh, of critique of American foreign policy that uh, was critical of of a lot of the expansionist and uh, and adventurism that was taking place. So uh, and at the same time. On the other hand, would never uh, would never take such a you know would not take a radical step and uh, certainly in that point in time and you know propose among other things that we have nothing to do with, with Southeast yeah. Asia, but okay. it's more so. This again, this is uh, you know let's this, do the right thing yeah. in Southeast Asia. And, yeah, and okay. in many ways you could uh, you could argue it's it, it is a group that becomes more and more marginalized within the anti war movement as time goes uh-huh. on. Yeah. As, as as you get greater militants and so on and so forth so anyhow we went down to that demonstration and I, I just remember that as being you know the first it was one of the first times I'd been if not the first time I'd been in Washington DC mm. and uh, and very soon after that became involved in my high school um, in uh, this would have been you know the the beginning of my senior year in um, which has been this case would be late it would late 1966 mm-hmm. um, in in an anti war movement and in this case I was like the liberal of the group you know very yeah. very polite no uh-huh. we shouldn't walk out when the mil- when their military recruiters right, are right. and right. have a dialogue with them we shouldn't walk out we shouldn't uh, I I was always like the temporizing I, I was you know a member of and the group. you and this is pretty early to be involved in the anti war movement in terms of the, the 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 wide the wide history it seems like it seems like the the when we think of like the Forrest Gump moment, you know, that's like nineteen sixty seven, right? Sixty eight, maybe. Well, it, it's it's a moment. It, it, it's right. Uh, it's that, certainly before the counterculture really becomes the visual, uh, you yeah. know, signifiers of well, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I guess we just say it's it's on the cusp. But what really strikes me about it is that um, what I immediately became uh, 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 introduced to. Mm-hmm. Uh, is first of all, is I grew up with having very little knowledge of the old left. Okay. Uh, whether it was socialist for that matter or communist, communist party, all the different tendencies, well, you, Trotskyist, it didn't make any difference. I didn't know from one from the other. Well, part of that, do you think, is because you grew up in a decade when that was being like forcefully erased? Yeah, but the interesting part, and this is what I discovered very, very quickly mm-hmm. uh, uh, among friends who I had known since freshman year in high school. Yeah. Oh, their parents had been in the party. My uh, parents had not. Yeah. I mean, that was what's quite striking to me. Or they had, you know, there had been a a romance, you know, the with CP the or the uh, CP. Uh, uh, SWP. Okay. No, no, yeah. no. I the, the, Trotsky is for the most part who I met. And, yeah. And that's what that was part of my introduction. So. Uh, all these Trotskyists were exotic because they were all Midwesterners. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were not, you know, they were not, or, I mean, I know there were people in New York, but I never uh-huh, met those uh-huh, type of people. Yeah. So my point is that when we, uh, when I became involved and we very quickly had learned that there was a mobilization that was going to take place in 1967 mm-hmm. in April, mm-hmm. which was a follow-up to one that had taken place in 65 in New York, which I 
virtually knew nothing about, mm. which was the, which was on Fifth Avenue. It had been the beginning okay. of, a, of yeah. an anti-war demonstration. So you're seeing an expansion taking place mm-hmm. at this period of time. And there had been an anti-war group, for example, in, in my high school the year before, but it was not as big as it mm-hmm. you know as it would be. And this uh, clearly has to do, among other things, with the escalation beginning to take place with you know in the war. Right. Um, so. Certainly over the course then of my high school experience, you're already having the escalation of the bombings of, mm-hmm. uh, you know, of North Vietnam on the part of, of the Johnson administration. And then this is the big moment when the civil rights movement yeah. and the anti movement basically come together. And this is when, when King would get, gave his speech in April, you know, April Of 67, 18, yeah. 18, yeah. 18, the, a, a year before he died. Uh, yes, right. Yeah, exactly. I think a year exactly before exactly. he died. Yeah, and that's, that's one. He that's really an amazing got censor, speech. You man. know, this is when Johnson would have nothing more to do with him. You know, this you know anger over the the you know his anti-war stance and so on. And this is when I I think it'd be argued the anti-war would explodes. It really mm. begins to mushroom. You know, it's on lots of campuses. That certainly the demonstration in New York on April fifteenth was massive. It was you know it was huge. Um, and that really, you know, and that, so, and that really colored so many things, you know, quite frankly, from the, from that moment on, certainly, you know, till the end of the war sort of colored as it did so many other people in the United States in my life. Well, um, you know, just go, to go back to that, that high school moment where you're starting to consider, you know, uh, opposing the war, um, where, where did that, where did the opposition to the, to the war come from, well, you know, beyond, like, were you connecting it to domestic politics in the way that King was going to eventually in 67 or was it something that the, that you just thought the war was being carried out in an unfair hmm. undemocratic way like you know a lot, a lot of people get into politics for a lot of different reasons some people are just pissed you know and they they're the anger drives their politics but where how did you relate to that stuff like I, I, I say that because I, I've talked to a lot of, you know, radicals from the 60s and, and many of them um, mention this feeling of like embarrassment or like shame that their country was doing this hmm. in Southeast Asia. Is mm-hmm. that something you mm-hmm. felt or do you remember? Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I do. It's it, it's a good question. I, I, I certainly became, you know, very, very well aware of the civil rights movement mm-hmm. very, very early. Um, yeah, that seems to be a common entry point. At least, if not, you know, in a, in a practical, like being involved in the movement, right. many radicals were like that was kind of their ideological learning learning moment. Yeah, although I was, you know, not involved in the answer yeah. movement, and and my parents were not. I mean, you know, they had African American friends, but uh-huh. they, you know, they they didn't. Uh, they were they were not directly involved. I remember, in fact, the interesting thing, and this is part of, you know, I think an interesting issue about sort of American culture that period of time, because Southeast Asia is really there a lot you know there's all these things uh, at this point he's never mentioned anymore this is dr tom dooley who was this ev- evangelist you know doctor uh-huh. uh who was writing these anti-communist sort of bestsellers mm. i remember reading them mm-hmm. you know and sort of but being completely enamored of them at yeah. this period you know of time i mean it's it's both sort of exotic it's it it was about a part of the world that one you know didn't know much about um I think that, uh, you know, this is part of the sort of awakening which uh, I shared with a lot of other period of time is, you know, your, your world sort of expands. I remember, you know, part of this I, I always felt was my move to the Upper West Side, which of course is, mm-hmm. was quintessentially liberal place. And I remember yeah. a bookstore opened called the New Yorker Bookstore, which doesn't exist anymore, which was tied to the New Yorker Theater, which mm-hmm. was a revival house, which no longer exists anymore oh, either. Boy. But the New Yorker Bookstore, among other things, had all of these radical publications or liberal publications. So I remember at that period of time starting to read The New Republic, which is hardly radical, yeah, right. and The Nation. And Rampart started soon uh-huh, after that, uh-huh. and, and quite a number of other publications. So your world is beginning. Uh, I have Stones Weekly. I yeah. mean these, and realizing the extent to which what you're reading in the main, mainstream press. And I was like a huge aficionado. I mean, I'd read two newspapers every day. Mm. Read the Times that my parents had delivered, and I, when I was going, I was such a nerd. I'd go, I'd go to on my way to school. I'd buy the Herald Tribune, yeah, which I, was the other sort of respectable Republican paper at the time. I, I was like this as a child too. Uh, <laughs> uh, when did that start? Do you remember? Were you always interested in current events? I well, you like know, that? Uh, well, I think it was more like the newspaper was always there. Were always newspaper. We got the Times always delivered in the mm-hmm. morning, and my mother always 
brought home the New York Post in the afternoon. This right. is when it was considered to be a liberal paper at yeah, the time. Yeah. And so there's they were always there. And then and then we'd always buy tons of the Sunday papers because of the funnies. Right. You know, the, right. the comic strips because you, you know, have my that. Was yeah, a you have that comic legacy. Yeah. So yeah. and plus we had a, a very close cousin who was a reporter for the Journal American. So uh-huh. I, there were a number of occasions I'd go to, which of course doesn't exist either at the time. But uh, now, but uh, so I actually sort of had would occasionally be allowed to go to the newspaper offices or mm, he would get mm-hmm. us into different things. So there was a sort of vague news. He was a crime reporter, but it was. It seems like print movie. media has has entered your life in a lot of different ways. Yeah. And certainly more than and of course, at that period of time, print media meant a hell of a lot more than a, than broadcast yeah. media in a uh-huh. lot of ways. Sure. So uh, anyhow, the this Southeast Asia, therefore, was sort of in, you know, in the uh, on the map of one's mind. Um, but I, I don't really, it really was not the merging of the two together for me until mm. I became more involved in in discussions and so on. Seems became like you have to be, I mean, I don't doubt that you were a, a, a smart young person. Seems like you, you need like um, a little bit more, you need to be a little bit older, start making those connections between. Or the, more knowledge. Yeah, I guess so. So how did that happen for you? I mean, how did you, how do you get to, um, uh, you know, turning eighteen in the in the middle of this war, how did how did that work out for you? And how did you be? Were you in school? I mean, how did you kind of not only not go to Vietnam, but not that everybody went, but but right. also, you know, how did you become more active in the anti war movement? Uh, well, I became I became much more active. I ended up uh, uh, because in in some part because of becoming very very active politically in high school i i didn't have the world's best grades also but the mm-hmm. uh i uh i didn't get into any college that i applied for except for uh city college okay uh, on 137 137 yep. which was at the time my high school was right on that campus so okay. you weren't really getting away from that campus but by october of 1967 so i'd only been in college for about three months i basically had dropped out and uh-huh. i can even pinpoint the day that it happened there was a a a very, very big uh, demonstration against the appearance of Dean Rusk, then the Secretary mm-hmm. of State, appearing in front of the uh, Foreign Policy Association at the Hilton Hotel. Okay. Uh, very rare for you know a Johnson administration official to be showing up in such a public venue. Yeah. It was a massive demonstration. And very an un- unpopular violent. figure at this point. Very unpopular yeah. at this point. Certainly, uh, there was a huge turnout. But it was also a very violent demonstration. Mm. Uh, a lot of, uh, in part, uh, a lot of police beatings. Uh, I'm sure there was provocation as well. I, I was stuck in a crowd where people were throwing things from the back of the this crowd. This is in Midtown? This is Midtown, right yeah. across the street from the Hilton Hotel, 53rd and 6th. Okay, yeah. And the, the I, I was one of these things where I just saw so many, and it's not a, a, that I hadn't been already involved in violent incidents mm-hmm. before, on the, in the 1967 demonstration, I had been a monitor, and you know, ant- pro-war demonstrators attacked the crowd, and you know, we there was a lot of there were a lot of people that ended what up. What kind of folks hospital. were the pro-war demonstrators in New York? Was that in New York? Yeah, it was in uh, Side Street, uh, going toward the United Nations. The the you know the the demonstrators would have to go down the side streets. Yeah, and I was along one of the side streets. It was a construction site. Okay. Uh, and they were throwing things from the construction site. That it wasn't old... construction workers. It was just guys who had clearly gathered there for, you know, they probably knew that there were things to throw there. Yeah. And the police did nothing until eventually some people got seriously hurt and re- they freaked out. And I think probably a TV crew showed up at the time that made them more, more freaked out. And all of a sudden, they restored order, order after chaos had reigned for a period of time. That's really interesting because I, I hope to have a, to Penny Lewis on this show. She wrote this book, Hard sure. Hats, Hippies, and Hawks. Right. It's about this, this kind of reactionary thing happening in New York and how it was a little bit manufactured reactionary. But but either way, that construction worker thing is fascinating to me. Yeah. Because we case, often I think, don't of, think they were constru- In this case, yeah. I, you know, this was a Saturday. You yeah. Know, it's like, uh, so these were gotten out. You know, maybe they were off duty, but they were also young. Yeah, these were like you know young guys who wanted to have a fight. But it's also that like, what I mean, what what uh, Penny Lewis argues in her book is that you know j- just to correct it, I think you're correcting it right here too, is that the con- the, the the idea of construction workers as automatically pro-war reactionary people is is kind of a misremembering of yeah. what of what that population was really like. A little yeah. more complicated than that. Yes, um, absolutely. All right, so you know, it's 1967. You said that October 67, this Dean Rusk thing. 
And um, that, so I stopped going to school. After that, yeah, basically. you stopped going to school after that. Yeah, and that, I started working pretty much for the anti-war movement. Is that because you you thought this was the fight of your life kind of thing, and uh, or or you know, it just didn't matter I, to you anymore? No, it was really more existential than that. Uh, I mean, in the sense uh, that. Uh, I literally went to class early the next morning, I believe it was a political science class, and I was just sitting there and saying, I can't sit in this classroom with with all this stuff going on. Mm, it's, mm-hmm. it, I mean, it, it, it sounds like a cliche now, but it really felt not only irrelevant, I mean, I do believe I was not really prepared for college in many ways, yeah. intellectually at that period of time. So there was an aspect to this too. It was also, I think, this sort of feeling of, um, of, of being at sixes and sevens after a very, very active, political and social group in high school and then you're, mm-hmm. you're although I was involved in a few city college things even early on right uh, and finally it really was you know this was the fall of 67 we're about to head you know the the Tet Offensive and a myriad of other things that I the think war was, is exploding yeah I think it was time. fall of 67 where uh, um, they did the the that that march on the Pentagon that, that, yeah, that trying that was to involved levitate in that the Pentagon October 67 yeah. yeah you were there for that yeah sure I didn't yeah. I didn't realize that oh, yeah, that's yeah. for me that's yeah. one of the most like incredible moments because it had this weird synergy between this kind of magical counterculture thinking and really like stoned out crazy yeah. shit yeah, um, yeah. Along, along with this real feeling of um, when I read those, like let's levitate the Pentagon stuff and the and the the, the curse on uh, 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 on the men in the Pentagon poems uh, that were part of this ritual, it, it it it's all like it's kind of heartbreaking to me because it's like this hmm. desperation, you know, that that you feel like people were searching for even like ridiculous ways, you know, maybe they didn't think that think of them as ridiculous at the time, but kind of almost you know, absurd ways to try right. and communicate their opposition to what was going on yeah and it kind of falls into this weird vaudeville well it's you know it's also the sort of origin of the yippies the, mm-hmm. you know that um you know for what it's worth it's funny that you mentioned it because about two weeks ago i i was watching um chris marker a filmmaker yeah oh yeah uh, he he did this 20 minute documentary called the thick side of the pentagon mm. it's only 20 minutes long and it's available on netflix and uh i didn't know it and when he died recently streaming uh, no, no, you have to get I had, it on. I you have to a, order the, the old disc. fashioned way. Yeah, <laughs> the old fashioned way. Order yeah. a DVD in the mail. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, it's it, there are two short documentaries that are on. The other one is uh, he was at this. I think it was a Swedish embassy when the Allende government, you know, was in overthrown. Seventy three. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but but it's so it's a twenty minute film. But I raise it because, um, you know, it's it's a very odd film. It's a French uh, left intellectuals vision of, of this really strange demonstration, mm-hmm. uh, which involves, of course, a confrontation at the Pentagon yeah. you know at, uh, and to, and while some people are trying to levitate the Pentagon at the same time and you do have this really uh, you're absolutely right this sort of sense of it was of course supposed to be a marker in terms of the anti movement from protest to resistance was the phrase that was that's used right. for that that's right yeah uh, and I was not at that time. I was there as a monitor. Um, that was right. What does what does it mean to be a monitor? You've mentioned that a couple of times. I know. Is that, is well, that like it usually a, means you're in trouble in one way or uh-huh, another. Yeah. Um, well, the idea always was that for all intent, and this came out of the civil rights movement, that you could not trust the authorities. Number one, to uh, res- really restore to both respect the law uh-huh. and to uh, maintain the peace. If you're trying mm. to have a peaceful demonstration. Uh, at the same time uh, as it was more likely that the people who you were working with that is in, in the protest would be more respectful of somebody else in the protest attempting to okay uh, so so the usually the in the case of for example of April 67 we were literally there as a buffer you know, all these scrawny guys but there mm-hmm. is a buffer between the demonstrators who were getting angrier and angrier at the pro-war demonstrators who were beating people up in the case of the of the um, of the Pentagon, it would be a bit more of just making sure that the line of march continued to go along. But mm-hmm. there were there was a period of time also where there would be much more militant types who would show up and they wanted to have a confrontation and trying to create some sort of buffer between. Okay, yeah, as I understand it, in the, on, on the October 60, 67 one in the Pentagon march was kind of a late afternoon um, something that happened in late afternoon after a, yeah. after a much larger march in the town proper, in right. Washington D.C. proper, right. whatever you want to call it. Well, yeah, it. this is when it was much more much more difficult. You know, there was no metro at the time. It was m- much more indirect to, to be able uh-huh. to march. Yeah. To you had to get, go across a bridge, and it was a very isolated. Pentagon was a very isolated at that period of time. Yeah, I, I mean, I still think of the Pentagon as isolated. Sure, although it's been a while since I've been over there. Um, 
So, you know, were you with a particular organization during this march? Or were there uh, I, people you looked to as spiritual leaders? No, not my spiritual. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, I, I was always a, an independent. Uh -huh. and, um, I, and in the case of... Um, Oh, the Pentagon. I was, I was there. I'm, I'm trying to remember what it was called at that point. It must have been the Mobilization Committee at that point in time. Yeah. In other words, it had been the Spring Mobilization Committee, which was the umbrella organization that had that. Uh, the Mob. The Mob, right? as, it, yeah. as it would be called in '68. Yeah. And, and and I ended up always either working for them or the New York equivalent, which was the Vietnam Peace Parade Committee. How did you find those people? You know, the I, Mobilization. I, yeah. Were there, were there offices? Or, uh, yeah. They, out of college campuses. N no, because again. And, uh, since I was in in New York, yeah, um, uh, they they always uh, in keeping with the 1930s, they always circle around Union Square. These offices, for one thing, office space was very cheap down there, mm. uh, and that that was uh, those were the days. Those were the days, yeah. and. Um, uh, because uh, some of my friends were much more aware, this is back in high school, that there were these, there was something in the air. Mm -hmm. We quickly went down to the national office. Always the national offices, if you're having a demonstration, either in, well, fr fr quite frankly, the national offices tended always to be in New York City. Yeah. Part of it was because there was a very large organized left that had even maintained itself throughout the 1950s and mm -hmm. into the 1960s, so that these, so that these offices would always be staffed by. There were coalitions and be staffed by basically a sort of detente between the different mm. factions of the old left with mm -hmm. a sprinkle of the new left the people and pacifists thrown in. Okay. So you'd have a member of the Communist Party band staff, the, the Socialist Workers Party would be there, there'd be a, a member of the War Resisters League or some other pacifist group. SDS like would have somebody there. there. What about y, the YSA? Well, YSA the, is the, was the youth group of the yeah. Socialist Workers Party. Uh -huh. So the y, yes, it would be the YSA and the- And were they reaching, how young were they reaching out to? Are they, they oh, they're reaching out school? to high school, absolutely. Yeah. They viewed, I know that the YSA viewed my high school group, which was called Music and Art Students Against the Wars Vietnam, mm -hmm. as potentially, as they called it, what they call it? They called it, um, oh, it'll come to me. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's used very much in, in, in religious terminology. Um, oh, okay. It'll, like it'll ripe converts or something. It was like almost, that. but it yeah. was, it yeah. was, uh, but they, 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 uh, 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 there was a sort of notion of, of you know, recruiting. Okay. Uh, and, and by the way, you know, they're very, very nice. They're very, very welcoming. They're very, very smart. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, they tamped down their politics. And that was true generally of all the coalition people at the time. You know, when you show up as a high school kid, it wasn't like people were trying to recruit you into, you know, the Communist Party. It was really more, you know, we're all here for, this would break down over time. But uh, yeah. But certainly that, you know, we have a common, you know, mission. But stylistically, you could sort of see it. The SDS people were a lot edgier. Mm, mm. Uh, and, of course, they stopped playing with everybody else after a certain so period. So would you call, were the SDS uh, people the hipsters? The, they were cooler and they were, they were just, they, I wouldn't, it's hard to say because they just. I know they, that word is, is rife with a whole yeah, lot of different Yeah, I, I mean, but. yeah, you're absolutely right in that uh, that the the left, the old left, tended to still have a cliched notion about how you deal with the working class. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, you know, you get screw cuts, and you know, you dress very dowdy, or you wear a lot of plaid, and you or, identify with the working class as like an aesthetic. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. There's there's certainly a, a sort of there. You, you live know, in their neighborhoods, even, and like oh, work, work in, you try and work in the factories. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the stuff that I looked at for my dissertation was about like people that exactly. join the military to yeah. try and like organize a working class much so. from a fa like like it was a factory. So, for example, among uh, the YSAers, the period of time, if you got drafted, yeah, you went in the military, yeah, because then you would organize within the military. Okay. So uh, it was you know you 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 know you followed a certain path that was tied to your political beliefs. Yeah, that's that's. That's ballsy, man. The, the the idea of like of of going to the military to try and organize yeah. is just is just mind blowing to me. It, well, it even seemed to me at the time to be self. Uh, you know, I, I admired it on one level. Uh -huh. On another level, I thought they were completely insane. Seems impossible in some respects. Well, that that that. Well, you've written all about that. So <laughs> yeah, you're... right. Yeah. Uh, I, well, I think that the people that tried to change the military, um, you know, it was unintended consequences in a sense. Yeah. You know, it wasn't. They didn't get to directly kind of force a program, but the, in some respects, you know, what what happened resulted in changes um, in some, and it's hard to trace, you know, a, a direct kind yeah, of causality chicken, there. Chicken egg, yeah. 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 There are a lot of different circumstances happening all at the same time. So, you know, was there, a lot of people kind of uh, periodize the, this kind of 60s Vietnam moment as, as um, 
Chicago, you know, sixty eight as as the as the kind of climax of all that activity mm. was was that was, did that how did that function for you? You you went to Chicago, yeah, right? Yeah, I, I so I worked yeah I worked uh, starting then for what it's worth in the it, I was working sort of inconsistently for a while or doing a lot of volunteer work. I since I could draw and and uh, mm. I, I got pulled in very very quickly to to both assist and then in a little while take over sort of doing a lot of the artwork for leaflets and in some cases posters, buttons, all that kind of stuff. So by less so, there was a very big spring demonstration, even bigger than the previous spring in uh -huh. in uh, 1968, in, in April 1968. Okay. Um, which gets a lot of less attention, but it really sort of indicated how, v and by the way, it was not only New York City, it was in cities around. around. Everywhere. And yeah. there was a lot of, uh, you know, there are a lot of very, mil there, there, the militants had really expanded. In, in December, uh, December 67, there were these uh, anti-draft demonstrations uh -huh. that were street pro really uh, obviously inspired also, or rather, let's say, synonymous with a lot of street protests going even on in Europe. Mm. I mean, I got arrested, it, for example, in, in December 67 at p being a monitor, but still involved huh. in these street you know, protests around in, the in draft. New York? In New York around the anti-draft. you say most of your activism was in New York? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Because I think that Berkeley, I think that's that way that end the draft or the stop the draft week was, was Oak, in the, Oakland. In, Oakland yeah, was in very Oakland. big in Oakland. Yeah, where there's a lot of footage of that in yes. Berkeley in the '60s. Of like, and that was same same period of time. Yeah. Same period of time. So, and New York was a, an utter failure. Huh. You didn't not only did you not stop. Everybody got arrested and got arrested big. Well, and, that's one of the things with these demonstrations is kind of like, well, how do you know it's a failure or a success? You know, in some <laughs> respects, it's kind of like, when are we done with the chant? Yeah. with 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 the chanting and the, you know what I mean? Yes. Like, and and I mean that being said, I think there are people that judge. You can judge like certain demonstrations were more successful than yeah. others. Well, but, you yeah, know, I think violence is usually regarded as a failure. Yeah. Well, I think it's also. To be blunt, a lot of it, particularly that period of time, was about press coverage. You know, uh -huh, you could have yeah. a, a very successful demonstration, or at least what you, in your own mind, or certainly your own experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the, you know, a, a period of time without any social media, of course, or anything like that. Mm. And, you know, uh, what if, a, you know, tr tree fell in the forest and nobody came? Well, it, it would... It, you made a valiant effort to try to get press coverage because you were trying to create an impact. Yeah. Uh, and this was the and famous... And trying to get the attention of, of media institutions yes. that have the technology to spread information. Exactly. Because, they're, mean, they're the arbiters still. Yeah, this. I mean, that's one of the things that... Uh, it's not all technology. It's not like technology to set us all free. There's certainly, you know, a lot of other components to the whole... to the media. But, um, you know, I was struck by the idea of, like, uh, a group of radicals get, get a mimeograph machine that they are hiding. You know, they're hiding the mimeograph machine because they don't want people to know that they have this piece of technology that's capable of spreading information right. around. And, and the, the kind of like acknowledgement of how much power it was just to have the ability to reproduce a piece of paper yeah. um, is incredible to me. Uh, OK, so how do you get to Chicago? How does that how does that happen? Uh, the... and, 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 and did you know Pegasus? Uh, I I may even have been in the vicinity. I don't it, it, I don't really remember the uh, actually. You know, it's one of these things where you get confused whether what you saw, what you heard about, and so on. Yeah, that's a nostalgia trap right there. As far as I'm concerned. It's well, like, as you get older, it gets more complicated. I was there. I met. Him. I think. Yeah, I think. I think I was there. Um, I was very very at that point in time. I was on the state at that point in time. So this would have been by the spring mm -hmm. of uh, of uh, sixty. Eight. Yeah, I was on the staff of the Vietnam Peace Break Committee. I was doing the artwork for it. There had been a big uh, split in the anti-war movement over. It was it was basically a split. Of, this was a case where some members of the old left, particularly the, the Socialist Workers Party and the Young Socialist Alliance, that's mm -hmm. its youth organization, were, were for all intents and purposes really uh, first sort of this, their staff was thrown out of mm -hmm. the coalition because there was a feeling. And there's a lot of dispute about this now, but about its manipulation of the agenda. In other words, as mm -hmm. a lot of the anti-war movement wanted to move uh, uh, to a more either more, more more militant or certainly it was a more militant position, and also there were issues about whether mobilizations actually were having much of an impact. Should there be other tactics? Um, I uh, the the part of the movement split. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there, of course, is a recognition that there's going to be this big event taking place. And Lyndon Johnson had, for all intents and purposes, you know, announced that he was not running. going to yeah. run again. Yeah. Uh, and it's hard to remember now, but, you know, the spring of 1968 um, was 
unbelievably turbulent. Mm. Uh, of course, you had the King assassination. Mm-hmm. You had the 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 Robert Kennedy assassination. Like, like six or seven weeks apart. Something yeah, like that. Uh, you yeah. had massive, massive riots th- throughout almost all major cities in the United States. My father describes this period of Spring '68 as when he he felt like a palpable sense that the the world was ending. Yeah, yeah. No, it really. Yeah, Clu- for what it's worth, for New York City, the Columbia. The Columbia uh, uh, demonstrations, which led to you know a student strike and a um, that's and right. a police and a police mm-hmm. you know and a mass and all of this the happening in the, um, with the Tet Offensive in January exactly. and it's, the violence in everything Vietnam. Everything is up. swirling. Everything swirling around. Again, I mentioned these very very large demonstrations. So you had a feeling of the world quaking at this period of yeah. time, and at the same time not having much control over it, particularly around the assassinations. Uh-huh. So every time. Um, so many significant figures, and I certainly was of that of that group of people who were very suspicious of Robert Kennedy and his motivations. Remember, also Eugene McCarthy had risen, risen as a candidate, anti-war candidate. The as clean well. genes that show right, up, yeah, right, who would show up in Chicago. So by the spring of of '68, I'm I'm participating in the meetings that are beginning to talk about Chicago mm-hmm. because you're going to have to do a presence in Chicago, and that we're going to have to organize to get people to go there. And a lot of sort of suspicions about the motivation of some of the people who are organizing it, like Tom Hayden at a period of time, who had had some sort of, had had different uh, unofficial um, uh, uh, overtures at times with, you know, more mainstream politics Mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. And certainly the direction he ended up going. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Yes. I mean, you know, he's taken weird paths, definitely. (laughs) Uh, Interesting paths. Uh But, uh, you know, many of these people I have much greater respect for than I did at the time because when you're, you know, younger too, you're you're not only extremely skeptical, but, you know, you're very pure. Well, yeah, and I think it would be easy to 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 kind of you know fall into romantic idealistic kind of thinking when you're when you're at either in the spring of 1968 i mean even even I feel like the, the splits that happened during that time were were in hindsight over you know they, they, uh, different kind of perceptions of what was happening yeah you know what i mean yeah. like people felt like oh this is the revolution this is the end of the world and we need to yeah and, and we're going to run this revolution. I mean, that ran the gamut all the way to Charles Manson, thinking that he's sure. going to like watch a race war happen. Well, you know, there's and take over the country. There's afterwards. certainly an awful lot of people. I was not among them uh, who thought a revolution was taking place. You know, there we were. There was a potential, and that certainly in '69 became even. You know, with certainly weather underground and things like that. Yeah, but, that's why. How did you bigger. how did you maintain a rational sense there? Because like I feel like if I I'm the kind of person that if I'd been alive during that time, I'd be like, it's all fucking coming down, man. I feel like I would have been that guy on the street and like. Well, you know, I have to say, maybe not. I don't know. I I just I, I don't know. I do know that when I did eventually get to Berkeley, which was in '69, I thought they were insane. Yeah. I just thought everybody there was crazy. Was it a younger generation by that time? No, no. Well, certainly they're they're beginning. Other yes, there are new people entering the entering like the Ma- coalition. But I I don't think it's that. Like the Mario I, Savios are starting to fade away a little. Yeah, bit. but you know I think some of it is also, and I this may be a gross generalization. When you're in a big city like New York, the reality factor keeps hitting you over the head a uh, lot. Uh huh. Uh, I mean, you, the, you know, there's much more acceptance, a lot of different opinions, and you could, you know, you you could always find your large constituency. Okay. So yeah. you know, there it's you know, you were not alone being against the war. Right. You know, in New York. Having said that, you also are really well aware of a lot of people who hated your guts at the same time. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, not to mention bastions of power, and you're 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 in the media capital of the world, where which is not paying any attention to you at the same time. I mean, there there are a myriad of ways it just didn't seem real mm. and more to the extent it felt like you had less and less control over the situation and finally and this was particularly true at chicago then in the end and this is where i perhaps then converged with my father's opinion nobody nobody gave a shit no one's going to remember this yeah i mean yeah. i remember being yeah. in grant park and there were um you know there were uh, national guard and troops uh blocking all this is back before they did all the renovations in Grant, in Grant Park. The only way to get out of Grant Park back to the city was over these bridges, mm, over mm-hmm. the railroad tracks and so on. And they were all blocked, and they were blocked with machine guns, and they were blocked with jeeps, you know, with wire, with barbed wire in front of them and so That's on. That's right. And yeah. realizing, we, and nobody showed up for Chicago. It was very small, you know, numbers of people. Well, I mean, hadn't Mayor Daley kind of expressed that, like, stay out of my city? Oh, yeah. Basically. Absolutely. I, I mean, yeah. did you guys did you guys have any sense that you were going to um, fight the cops, or the cops were going to fight you? Well, there, were, there was a... Uh, 
I remember going to, as soon as I arrived in Chicago a few days <clears throat> before the demonstrations uh -huh. were starting. And, you know, I was really young. I was like 19. I mean, I was really yeah. young. And I remember but going... But already a, a history as an activist. Well, so you know, it, it was... You know, it was mesmerizing. It was actually, you know, when you think about it, a very concentrated period of time, a short yeah. period of time. Yeah, yeah. But this is events were, you know, moving very, very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And going to Grant Park with my friend who who, who was already working in the coalition, and uh, actually, I think it was Tom Hayden and a bunch of other people were practicing snake uh, dancing. I think it was called the Japanese uh, resistance mm -hmm. tactic. Uh, against the police at that period of time, and there, so all these people are doing this sort of, you know, pr pr with the police, all the police watching them also at the same time, yeah, practicing yeah. in the park as ways to sort of defy the police. Because the idea is you, you wow. create, you create an Im impermeable line of demonstrators that the police can't break through. Mm. Which, by the way, never happened. It never took place. But so there was this in some people's minds notion. Well, we it may come to that, and we're going to need to, you know, resist and so on and the so forth. The radicals look to the east in more ways than one. It seems like during this. Well, era. you know, yeah. they, they were, uh, and you know, some people were wearing hard hats and things like that. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and so on. But you know, when it came down to it, no, it, it ended up being a it really a police riot, and they were people just running this way and that, and and that mm. was of course later in, at night at you know at, in front of the Hilton. Yeah, and I, I imagine that lots of young people right i mean oh they were it was it was about the young crowd and then you know there was a fairly substantial anti-war movement in chicago so yeah. it, it those numbers got filled out a little bit more but i remember as one of the people was running this new york movement center and maybe we had a few buses that showed up it was not now other uh, people came uh -huh. by other ways but um i'm just saying you know you we're talking in in if you ask me how many people i'm gonna pull you know uh a number out of my hat, but I would say no more than thirty thousand people mm, altogether yeah, were. It was right. it was yeah. it was small. I remember when the when the big rally in Grant Park, um, which is the first like big police attack um, against the demonstrators. They had already been clearing the parks as per daily, saying nobody's yeah, going to see yeah. in my parks. They cleared Lincoln Park and another other things beforehand nights beforehand when people tried to sleep there but in this case it was during the demonstrations and the police attacked during the demonstrations and um the i, I lost my train of thought here what yeah. i was even talking yeah. about yeah well we're, 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 I, it's mesmerizing to hear about chicago for me because it seems like such a carnival of of, of so many so many elements uh, um happening at once and and you know you you said you'd mentioned that that was kind of your a moment where you kind of saw what your dad saw in a sense of like right. well the, this the, is sin is, a, the people are not going to care you're banging your head against the wall kind of thing and we, we could easily be done away and i don't think it was even being melodramatic it felt like with all the things that have been taking place that uh you were in, in an alien enough environment mm. and maybe this is as a new yorker but an alien enough environment that uh for all intents and purposes everybody could be arrested if not you know killed to be melodramatic yeah. and it really would have no impact whatsoever. I mean, the ironic mm. thing about Chicago is it had, in many ways, a huge impact thanks to the overreaction to a great extent of the, of the authorities. Yeah. And, but then what, you know, this this is part of the sort of cynicism. The part of the reaction was Nixon becoming president. Right. So, I mean, how did you how did you respond to all of that? Because, I mean, in, in a sense, you live through these two boogeymen from previous eras coming back to be president. Right. Where Nixon comes back from the 50s and, mm -hmm. and is president in 68. And then and then Reagan emerges in the early 80s after uh, having been present during all this stuff in Southern California as governor. Um, how did you fight cynicism and demoralization or did you not fight it and just give into it completely? I mean, I feel like 68 was uh, um, that, uh, you know, maybe this is because it's a cliche of like 60s documentaries of like after Chicago, we all kind of went our separate ways and we went to graduate school the big and chill. we went, yeah, and we went and, and we yeah. joined communes and we all went our separate directions. W was that something that you felt in your life? Did you go a separate direction? No, um, but I do think that there was a period of time where... Um, there was a sense of bewilderment about what to do, what to do next. Certainly, there was a generation of people, and this is, you know, speaking of my parents. My parents' notion was, Richard Nixon became president. It's like the worst thing that could have ever happened. Uh, uh huh. Bar none. We, you know, I mean, they were just appalled. Why by, was that? I mean, I know there are many reasons to hate Richard Nixon, but why? Why were they so? What was it about Nixon that was so repulsive to them? 
Uh, well, I think a lot of it, you know, went back all the way back, probably the Alger Hiss and uh, uh -huh. to, uh, and to like virulent anti-communist, virulent anti-communism. Again, my, my, you know, my mother being a, a liberal Democrat, uh, he was the antithesis because of, uh, uh, well, first of all, he also viewed as a crook, as dishonest, as unbelievably, you know, his public persona was so icky. Slimy. To begin with. No and, one bought that checker speech thing? I don't think anybody ever <laughs> did, but, uh, you know. It's it, always, it, like, brought up. I, I mean, the first time I heard of the checker speech was probably when I was pretty young. I right. Mean, I was like, and I'm like, oh, that's, this is, it's, always, it's always presented as, like, this endearing moment. But now I think of it as, like, just this hucksterism of the yeah, shittiest I, variety. I, I, I don't know. You know, it's a, it, it, you know coming from a, a family that, that loathed Nixon from the get-go. Yeah. Um, you know, they would always view him as being, you know, disingenuous I and mean, everything that he you're said. A puppy, for Christ's sake! Yeah, I mean, it's like the oldest trick in the book. Well, you know, it's and I'm always, not going to give this puppy back because yeah, exactly. my kids love it. But That's it's like, also hard to wow. know, you know, the you know, simply making a sort of uh, committed uh, public performance like that might have been all he needed. In other words, it, yeah. it didn't have to be convincing; it had to be make an effort and, uh, and reading about him and his relationship with Eisenhower I ended up yeah. feeling sorry for him a lot because they, Eisenhower made him cry I mean the, the, honestly if you haven't read about Nixon Nixon is just like one of them filled with so much pathos it's incredible well he's a fascinating well just you know the, these are fascinating figures mm -hmm. you know if I can detach myself at the same time as there are an awful lot of dead people you know due to their and that's part of when you were asking about the cynicism um, I was certainly at that point in time I was I, I couldn't even vote yet you know the, mm. the, the uh, voting was still uh, 21 and um, the amendment, I think, had just passed, but it would, was not applicable for the 1968 election. And so my notion was, I remember, in fact, uh, the slogan, because I did a lot of drawing for it for the fall of 68, was, uh, you know, something like uh, protest the, uh, the, the Humphrey-Nixon-Wallace, because George Wallace mm. was running as an independent, uh, ticket or coalition for their pro-war policies. So yeah. in other words, they all, in one way or another, were making an argument for, even when they were pretending, as in the case, as we know, of, of Nixon, uh, um, they were, for, were all intense. So to my mind, there was no difference. Yeah, uh, well, that no difference thing of like that, you know, foreign policy is bipartisan notion, you know, has led a lot of people, I think, to, to, to radicalism is kind of realizing, sure. especially around war, that, you know, when it comes to war, there really is no like opposition in, in, in terms of like the mainstream politics. There's there's uh, pro-war and more pro-war on, on either side. And that's a really disturbing thing for, I think, for a lot of people to come to terms with. And certainly for for my my own uh, kind of radicalization is, is through 9-11 and the Iraq mm, war and, mm -hmm. and that kind of, and I think that was happening bef even before all that stuff happened, but realizing that both the Democrats and Republicans had deep interests in, in keeping these wars going. Um, so, okay, so, you know, how do you, how do you move from getting over the Vietnam War and, and moving on in your life? You, 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 you eventually go to graduate school. Yeah, but that was, that was a... Much a, later? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't, so I stayed, I was a, I continued being a drop, I, I was a dropout all the way until like 1970. And you saw that as like a political thing in a sense? No, I, I mean, again, Every time that I attempted to, I, I had the best intentions in mind. In fact, I very briefly also uh, registered for art school. In, mm -hmm. like, that was the fall of... Well, it seems like a lot of your life was heading that way in a sense. Yeah, well, it, you know, the, the problem was that I would I would go there and uh, and it's, again, you know, hard to, to you know, to picture this now. But things are still, you know, very, very turbulent. It just felt to me like uh, I wasn't prepared to sort of separate off my life from what was happening yeah, and, and yeah. had to be contended with. I also had, uh, I wouldn't quite use the term luxury, but I had I had a place always in the coalition because they needed, they could use my artwork. Uh -huh, yeah. So I would make a big 60 bucks a week uh, mm -hmm. as for my, um, mm -hmm. you know, my um, salary, uh, my pay. And uh, so there was a place for me. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, you know, there, I do think that there was a definite, and, and I was very lucky, but, but not getting drafted. I mean, mm. I, I, you know, went through a physical and I went through a period of being investigated because of, Was know, that a constant fear throughout that time that you were going to well, have to deal with that? Did you have a plan a, in place? No, I didn't have any plan, which is part, you know, if I, if I used to say I, I have two, you know, completely grown sons now, and as I've often said to them, if, if 
they had acted the way I had acted, I would have killed them. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, I, I do feel for my parents. And, this, and uh-huh. that was part of my uh-huh. father's thing, is that yeah. he was terrified about me getting drafted. Yeah. Just yeah. terrified about it. Yeah. I had a vague notion. I wasn't going to go to jail. Yeah. I felt that that was too self-sacrificial. I had this vague notion that I would go underground, which sounds fantastic now, but I knew a lot of people. You know, there was yeah. a no- yeah. network. This was happening. But that would have, you know... That would have been a whole different, you know, life. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you've read uh, Tim O'Brien's "The Things They Carry." Yes, yeah. Yes. That, that he at the beginning of that book, he he goes to Canada because right. he, he thinks he's gonna do that, um, and he's not able to do it. Right. And the the, yeah. li- the line that's amazing is is I was a coward, I went to the war, <laughs> and and just and for me that like it kind of speaks to exactly that yeah. kind of trap that you're in yeah. when you're that age. Um, all right, so you know we are, we, I, I, we got to wrap it up. I know sure. there's a more of a history to you, but if we could just sure. kind of get, uh, get to where you are now somehow, you know, um, you're you you are uh, the director of the American Social History Project here at CUNY. Um, you know, when you think of that that past that you have of as an anti-war activist mm-hmm. and as an artist. Um, do you re- does it relate at all? I mean, it seems like it, do- it, do- it seems like it's very direct in terms of your your work here is 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 political um, in, 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 and I don't mean in a necessarily activist way sure, sure. but it, it, it's it's about kind of you know uh, contextualizing history in a way that's 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 I think very important. So can you talk a little bit about what the American Social History Project is and sure. what, what, how you got involved with it? Sure. Well, I, I think that the first thing that needs to be said is that there was a logic to going into history eventually. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I won't bore you with all the de- many many years in between, but uh-huh. uh, and I was I'm not alone in being a generation of historians who. Um, felt that one reason they went to history because they realized they didn't understand this country mm. uh, and had had mm-hmm. it played an activist role in one way or another. Mm-hmm. I think it's true of a wide range of of people, certainly who are now all in their 60s, if not older. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, so uh, that was my motivation for going into starting to study history. Uh, having said that, and I, and I very much was doing labor history for a period of time, uh-huh, history uh-huh. radicalism, uh, studying it. Um, the Social History Project was, and I got involved also in the Radical History Review, which is important That's as right. a sort of nexus, uh, the, which very much, uh, which had, I think, a, a, a significant impact on the profession in, uh-huh. in a lot of different ways. Uh, many, many, you know, significant and well-known historians now, you know, cut their teeth or had their first publications. This is back when the mainstream publications were And that includes, those some of your first publications in Radical History yes. Review? Yeah. yeah, you've got yeah. a great review of Deer Hunter. That, that, was, that, that was my first publication. Yeah, in, it still stands there. as, to me, one of the, one, <laughs> the, one of the most solid interpretations of that film. And certainly with the Radical History Review was the first time when I could actually do artwork that was about history and politics at the same time. Cool. That gave me, mm-hmm. that gave me. And that's where Steve Breyer, who st- was co-founder, Founded the Social History Project, and I first future met. podcast guest Steve Breyer. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and Steve and I. Uh, Steve was also on the New York. Uh, we at the time we called the Collective of, uh-huh. of the Radical History Review, Marho, the Radical Historians Organization. So when he, with Herb Gutman, the the late labor historian, uh-huh. founded uh, the Social History Project there and got a grant, and I had worked not only with Steve and and on the Radical History Review, but also we had worked together on several other projects. Uh, he, this was very much founded as being at the time taking the new social history, largely new working class history, mm-hmm. which was extending beyond the history of labor unions, mm-hmm. uh, and trying to get it out of the university where yeah. it was pretty much locked up at this period of time. It had very, very little impact on the public mind. Yeah. It's very, very yeah. different than it is it is now. Uh, when I say writ large, this is a history of slavery at this period of time. This is, you know, a large part. Yeah, I mean, of, this is uh, Gutman is the 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 guy that uh, it sounds like inspired a lot of your kind of methodology. In, yeah. in, in in a lot of respects. But for for those that don't know, uh, Herb Gutman, he was a historian that wrote about um, slavery a, a lot in terms of uh, be entering into a, a number of significant historiographical debates about slavery. Yeah, during mainly the era. black family. Yeah. Uh, the, uh-huh. the persistence of the black family and, in slavery and his critique of time on the cross right I'm yes just remembering my orals here but that's right. you know, either way no, that's a good book yeah either way the um goodman is someone who who uh um really kind of rearranged a lot in terms of what history could be and for me it was someone who um really it was inspiring so i feel like you were similarly right yeah well he was he was he was an inspiring he was did, a character he, but did he come to 
the graduate yes, center? Yes, he was at yeah. the graduate okay. center. Uh, he, he had been at the University of Rochester, then he came to City College, and then he was at the grad center. Uh, what what made her uh, unique, he was certainly, uh, you know, sometimes a challenge to work with, but uh-huh. he was also his commitment to democratic education, a yeah. commitment to trade union education. So I thought that with the exception of some people like David Montgomery, there were some, some other historians, for his generation, he was extremely and actively committed. I mean, in other words, I don't think it's an accident that the Social History Project, which was originally called the American Working Class History Project. Oh, wow, I didn't realize that. Yeah, that yeah. was its first name. And then when we got a whole bunch more money, we realized that we wanted to re- we were going to do a larger reinterpretation than only working class history mm-hmm. of, as a, as a textbook and as a multimedia and I feel curriculum. Like the term social history has a kind of working class sensibility in in, in it. Yes, well, it's yeah. also its origins are at least very very populist. Obviously, a lot of this was also influenced by British Marxist right. uh, you know history, mm-hmm. which social history really became much more symbolic of a of a generation. In some cases, former Communist Party, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, members, uh, historians who really redefined, you know, the field yeah, yeah. and had a huge influence in the United States as well. Herb really sort of came out of that, you know, that influence as well. But I raise that because then within the university, although we were in a university setting, we were very much sort of focused on how do you not only trade union education, but then it began to expand to community colleges. We ironically enough, got you know large funding from the Ford Foundation mm-hmm. to expand this, to make it into a multimedia project. We began to work uh, with an uh, alternative schools in the New York City public school system. I mean, we found, surprise, surprise, that this material had a uh, had a, a potentially very, very wide audience because it, it made, it's not simply made history accessible. We're not talking about, um, you know, dumbing down, mm-hmm. but rather it opened up the question of history, realizing that, that you know, particularly in this case, you know, younger people could understand that uh, history obviously has a proud, profound impact on their lives and is not simply this story as it become a cliche now, of course, of, uh, you know, dead white men and, mm-hmm. and, you know, and established leaders. Yeah, and that there are, you know, lots of other voices to listen to. And I think that, you know, I, I, I've been teaching, lately I just broke down and started teaching uh, Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States, um, you know, and, and teaching it from a critical perspective in the sense of like, Good. let's look right. at, let's look at this as like a, a um, as how to, how you how you can form an argument out of these things because Zinn has like basically one point over and over and over and, right. over, and over again and he's just uses and so in that sense it's it's a good book to show s- students how you can use evidence to kind of formulate how whatever argument you want in, in a certain respect um, but at, at the same time I think that students are always kind of impressed by that idea of what you're talking about it's not it's not about dumbing down it's about realizing that there are lots of other voices and I feel like that Zinn's book if nothing else kind of introduces that notion really well that like it's it's uh, uh, it's about listening to those other voices and and um, the American social social history project has some stuff on um, the depression that I use a lot those those um, the youth during the depression oh use those videos great, great. yeah mm-hmm. the um, those are on YouTube I yes think, yes they are, so are yes you, are you still producing films actively with the American social history project or what what is the what is the the main mission now well you know one of the problems uh, which I think uh, all sort of public history and edu- history education projects f- confront are the whole question about funding. Yeah, uh, the, uh, the 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 those programs on YouTube, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, are indicative also where, for example, NEH was giving funding for that you know th- mm-hmm. that type of work. Um, I think yes, there'll be some sort of short docu- short documentaries. When I say short, under five minutes type yeah. of work that that. I suspect will be in the cards because we found that the teachers desperately need that type of stuff. And because they they provide a sort of context that they can work from, Mm -hmm. they're obviously now quite accessible in terms of they're free, not not to mention that. And the technology is such that, you know, this used to be a huge amount of, I mean, a huge amount of work. I mean, well, you know, you've done film studies. Oh, yeah. That uh, the the technology now now allows you to... uh, it's all labor intensive to be mm-hmm. sure, but uh, but allows you you know much greater access. So I think it, it will take place, but I don't think it's going to be as programmatic as it used to be uh, for us because sure. um, it's it's just quite frankly another unfunded project. Yeah, yeah. You just send young people into the street with cameras to make their own films. That's that's well, like, that's another thing yeah. that that you know you can and it's not a bad thing to do obviously in terms of trying to get people to learn how to present an argument you know in other formats and so yeah, on and so yeah. forth. Uh, but 
Okay, so well, one right. one last thing before we go is that you've got a uh, you 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 have a comic now called Life During Wartime. Is that sort right? Of, yeah. yeah, you say sort of, but you, <laughs> I, I see them almost like once every week or once a couple weeks. Well, I, I had a hiatus for a few months. What are you doing? What are you doing right now with these these fabulous Toke brothers? Toke brothers. Well, I, part- I, I feel like it kind of connects so many things about your history <laughs> in a sense. This, these these cartoons that that are I think very transparently attacking the Koch brothers, obviously. But, yeah, it's but, not subtle. Yeah, but but what what is what is life during wartime, and and what are you doing with that? Right. Well, what are, you, what, are you, what are your hopes for it? Well, my my hope originally was simply you know this it started in two thousand and three mm-hmm. uh, thanks to George Bush because mm-hmm. it started right when the Iraq War started and it was part of the first noted. You mean noted painter and artist? Noticed, George, noted noted painter. W. Yes, right. exactly. The, the Yes, the the up and coming Rembrandt. Um, and did you, by the way, see the onion thing about? Yes, that? it's great. It's wonderful. Of the Iraqi it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. In fact, I was just showing it to somebody on Saturday night. This, this is it. This captures exactly. <laughs> yes, his his repre- if We dig up. Maybe it's you know he has like um, there are layers underneath his painting uh, with pentimento, and it's going to come through oh, all the God. all the blood and so, so on. So disturbing. Um, yeah, yeah, the long and short of it originally was an, an attempt to reach. Fell friends and colleagues who I knew. This is the beginning of the Iraq War. When remember, it was really rah rah at the mm-hmm. beginning. Oh and the God, media, yes. And the media was there was very little criticism in the media or anything like that. And the internet, of course, allowed the capacity to to do these, uh, you know, uh, illustrations, cartoons to a constituency I knew that was feeling, you know, pretty beleaguered. Um, and it sort of took on a life of its own. And it was really the first consistent artwork I'd done in, in quite a number of years. Mm-hmm. Um, as time has gone, and, and I, I did it, uh, it would be once every week, once every two weeks, depending on, you know, the time, yeah. you know, and effort. Ideas, which are n- not a small part of it. Yeah. Passion, sure. too. Uh-huh. Um, it, it's become more sporadic over the time. I keep waiting for the wars to be over, so, you yeah. know, maybe I could stop since, you know, it's, it's one thing that my wife has said to me. It says, you know. Isn't it exhausting? I mean, that's what I, well, I, when I think of, when I think of people who were fighting the Vietnam War as uh, as as you know uh, aggressively as as you were, uh, isn't it just isn't isn't it just hard to fall into cynicism when it just happens again and again well, and again? Yeah, I mean, you know, I you know, I think the Obama uh, you know presidency is an interesting example of mm-hmm. it in the sense of I've I found it harder to do not because I'm not critical. As I am yeah. of the of the Obama administration is that it it doesn't quite have the uh, catharsis that mm. that it did uh, at least partially you know with Bush yeah uh, there's why, a little why more sorrow is that there. to see liberal it's, it's, is it more depressing to see liberals part of it I think is disappointment maybe that was probably you know too unrealistic to begin we're with. all dealing with that I right. think. <laughs> we're yeah. all dealing with it. so the Toke brothers. I, so I've had another hiatus. I had a hiatus when I was on leave and I was doing research and uh-huh, I couldn't uh-huh. and I thought I, I really got to focus. And then I had a hiatus, you know, fairly recently because I just was too busy in yeah. terms of it. I, I do find just personally that in many ways when I do get down to it, I like it a lot because you're using a different part of your brain. It's it's just a mm-hmm. different experience yeah. working it if you have the idea. The Talk Brothers struck me, all it says is is you know the the Koch brothers in another mm-hmm. form of mm-hmm. course you know a parody, sort of and um, but I thought this might give me a vehicle where I could be telling a narrative and I really don't have an idea but it can be bouncing off of current events yeah. so that yeah. because the the life during wartime is very much one idea you know like a New Yorker cartoon not necessarily with a good caption but you know right. with the, with a notion that it's going to sort of it's got to have an oomph. It's going to work all in and of itself. Whereas you can sort of have a slightly wacky narrative, which obviously is also inspired by, among other things, the fabulous furry freak brothers. Yeah, uh, uh, um, and you've got that kind of like that 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 history is pre- of of comics is present in your work in a lot of different <laughs> ways. I feel like I'm missing some references when I when I see when I see your stuff. But today, you um, the the strip that I that I that I saw, I think it's the latest one, is about the Bundy Ranch yes. thing, right? And yes. I, um, I'll put it up on the website. It's a it's oh, a you. fabulous image because it, it kind of uh, for for me there there's. Uh, it's kind of pointing out there are two different kinds of like anti-government wackos, you know, uh, um, and and they're either like these these kind of like pseudo-fascist kind of military dudes, uh, uh, the signified militias. by the yeah the militia Bundy people, um, and then you know the Koch brothers are anti-government right, too, right? But that but culturally these two are when, when, are, are one nowhere likes opera. near each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. It speaks to I think uh, a lot of why I think I find your your work so so interesting. I thank, thank you, you so much for sitting down with me. Well, thank you.